really pleased to be able to hand it over to my wonderful colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Eric Hintz, who's a historian with me at the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation, which is part of the Smithsonian's American History Museum. Um, and he is going to talk uh, mostly about uh, his new book, which is called Does America Need More Innovators, which I know you'll find fascinating. Uh, but he has also uh, curated exhibits. Um, I had the chance to work with him as a curator on our Places of Invention exhibition that is still on display at American History. Uh, he also has worked on and produced our annual symposium series called New Perspectives on Invention and Innovation. He coordinates our fellowship and grant programs, and he does obviously a lot of research and writing. Um, he is also the author <clears throat> um, of, um, sorry, American Independent Inventors in the Era of Corporate R&D is the book he's really talking about today. Uh, he's also edited the book, Does America Need More Innovators? And uh, he earned his MA and PhD in the history and sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but he's also just a great person uh, and has been a, a wonderful colleague all these years. So I'm very pleased to turn over the mic to him to talk about invention today. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, and you guys already know this, uh, but Monica is also a wonderful colleague and just a great friend. So I was delighted to receive the invitation uh, from her to speak to your group today. So I just wanted to thank Monica. Uh, I'd love to thank everyone uh, at the Rotary Club of Washington, DC for inviting me to speak with you today. And I especially just wanted to thank you for all the great service work that you do. Um, I just love that about the Rotary Club. I've heard a lot about that from Monica over the years. And I think it's great that you guys really um, put your shoulder into making um, our region really great uh, through all the generous work that you do. So um, as Monica mentioned, um, we're colleagues at the Smithsonian Institution where we study inventors and the history of invention. And one of the big questions that motivates our work and my research is deceptively simple. And it's, uh, and it's this, uh, who invents? Um, maybe asked another way, who represents the best source of inventions? Is it uh, a mysterious solitary genius like the 19th century electrical inventor Nikola Tesla? Or is it a team of corporate scientists at DuPont uh, who invented synthetic materials like nylon and neoprene in the 1930s and 40s? Or in a more contemporary context, are useful inventions more likely to come from a solitary inventor like Mark Zuckerberg who coded Facebook in his Harvard dorm room? Or are they more likely to come from the R&D teams at big firms like IBM, Samsung, and Microsoft uh, who collectively earn thousands of patents per year? Well, it turns out uh, that people have been debating this very question for nearly a hundred years. Uh, on December 11th, 1927, Maurice Holland of the National Research Council delivered a luncheon speech titled, The Vanishing American Genius. Holland suggested that, quote, the independent inventor of today has little chance against the formidable research organizations of modern industry, and that the days of the solitary genius in the garret had passed. The work of invention, Holland argued, was now directed by teams of salaried scientists and engineers working in a thousand industrial laboratories across the United States. Holland's speech garnered an impassioned response. Uh, for example, Assistant Patent Commissioner William A. Kennan protested that, quote, the day of the independent inventor has not passed. Nothing could be further from the truth. This fallacy, said Kennan, had emerged thanks to boosters like Holland, who tended to exaggerate the increasingly important role that corporate laboratories were playing in the production of new technologies. So this exchange captures many of the historical themes and tensions in my new book. As Monica mentioned in August, uh, I was pleased to publish American Independent Inventors in an era of corporate R&D with MIT Press. The book considers the changing fortunes of American independent inventors since the emergence of science-based industrial research. The book challenges several long-held assumptions about the sources of invention during an important transitional period in the first half of the 20th century. The earlier 19th century had witnessed the so-called heroic era of invention when mythic individuals such as Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell created entirely new industries from their inventions while achieving widespread fame. However, beginning around 1900, several large firms, including General Electric, DuPont, AT&T, and General Motors shown here on the right, established the first research and development laboratories in which teams of PhD scientists collectively developed new products and processes with all the resulting patents assigned to the company. 
And eventually, many contemporary observers joined Holland in the belief that corporate R&D labs had displaced independent inventors as the wellspring of innovation. But in fact, the first half of the 20th century was a long transitional period when lesser known independents such as Chester Carlson, Garrett Morgan, Marion O'Brien Donovan, and Earl Tupper made notable contributions to the overall context of innovation. So contrary to most interpretations of, of this period, I argue that individual independent inventors were not supplanted by corporate R&D labs, but instead persisted alongside them as an important, though less visible source of inventions. The book focuses on the years from 1890 to 1950, an epilogue traces how independent inventors have fared since World War II. Overall, the book reframes the period from 1890 to 2015 as an era when both independent inventors and corporate R&D labs contributed substantially to technological innovation. It asks and answers this big question. What was it like to be an independent inventor during an era of corporate R&D, to be a David in an era of Goliaths? So before presenting uh, a few highlights from the book, let me quickly define and characterize these two competing modes of invention. So an individual lone or independent inventor like Marion O'Brien Donovan shown there on the left uh, was defined by his or her relative solitude and autonomy. Independents did not perform their work as salaried employees. Rather, they worked for themselves and made their own decisions about which problems to pursue. Most individual inventors usually worked alone, although some retained one or two assistants, often members of their family. Independents were responsible for setting up and equipping a suitable place to work, which often meant their kitchens, basements, or garages. Some independents invented full-time and some moonlighted as part-time inventors while working conventional jobs to support themselves and their families. Independents retained control over their intellectual property and they incurred all the upfront financial risks involved in trying to bring an invention to market. The life of an independent inventor was often financially precarious, since he or she might spend years developing an idea before realizing any profits, if ever. In contrast, an industrial researcher, corporate scientist, or employee inventor, like the long line of white-coated uh, industrial researchers shown there at Bell Labs, they performed uh, their duties as full-time salaried employees. While the educational attainments of independence varied widely, an industrial researcher usually held an advanced degree in physics, chemistry, or engineering as a prerequisite for employment. Once hired, industrial researchers joined a team of fellow scientists and technicians who worked collaboratively in a fully equipped R&D laboratory. Industrial researchers tackled specific problems assigned by their research director, Sometimes these were pure open-ended scientific investigations, but corporate scientists usually engaged in applied research to improve the firm's existing products and operations. As stipulated in their employment contracts, industrial researchers assigned any new inventions to their firms. The corporation and its stockholders, not the individual researcher, incurred the risks and costs involved in commercialization. So the firm also kept any resulting profits. So the life of an industrial researcher was usually uh, pretty financially stable, but there was a ceiling on his or her earning potential. Corporate scientists typically received a straight salary for their work, which was paid whether a particular line of research panned out or not. Industrial scientists might receive a bonus for earning a patent, but none of the downstream revenues of a successful commercialization. Okay, so with those distinctions in mind, let us dive into some highlights from the book. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, by the end of World War I, there was kind of this um, uh, drumbeat of assertions from critics uh, who had been claiming that independent inventors were on the brink of extinction. And of course, the independents had not uh, disappeared, but I wanted to try to understand the roots of this misperception. So for example, I found that several Black inventors intentionally concealed their own identities to avoid prejudice at the patent office and in the marketplace. Garrett Morgan, uh, for example, shown here, was an African-American inventor from Cleveland who went to great lengths to conceal his racial identity. Morgan patented a gas mask in 1914, but to avoid prejudice, he featured white actors in his advertising literature, as shown on the left. He also hired white associates to pose as him while demonstrating the gas mask at inventor's fairs and trade shows. Now, the Cleveland newspapers revealed Morgan's racial identity during a daring, highly publicized rescue in 1916. And there you can kind of see Morgan uh, on the right with his gas mask. And um, when his uh, racial identity was revealed, this actually led racist customers to cancel their orders. 
So in a paradox driven by prejudice, Morgan was more commercially successful when he intentionally concealed his race, but less successful when publicity favorable to his invention revealed his true identity. In addition, I found that the big firms developed sophisticated PR campaigns to extol the virtues of corporate R&D while characterizing the independence as antiquated and extinct. For example, this 1924 General Motors advertisement on the left featured a solitary mechanic in his garage, yet the copy suggested that automotive developments were, quote, no longer dependent upon the work of isolated inventors, but rather emerged from GM's six-acre plant in Dayton, Ohio, quote, the largest research laboratory of its kind. A decade later, General Motors converted its Chicago World's Fair ex exhibits into a traveling circus for science they called the Parade of Progress. Between 1936 and 1939, 50 men drove a caravan of 33 vehicles to 146 cities and amazed 3 million visitors with displays of GM's R&D prowess. So, you know, with their superior resources devoted to advertising and PR, uh, the corporations, I argue, convinced the public that independent inventors were obsolete and extinct, while portraying the R&D labs themselves as the wave of the future. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to look into, okay, is like, you know, with the emergence of R&D labs and all this competition, how did, how did the independents actually survive? So I spent time thinking about, or, you know, researching how they actually earned a living. Well, it turns out that um, the independents partnered uh, with their corporate rivals. Despite uh, the disparaging uh, advertising rhetoric, corporate R&D labs frequently forged cooperative alliances with independent inventors to purchase and license their patents as a complement to the inventions they developed in-house. So for example, in 1914, Henry J. Gaisman invented the so-called autographic Kodak, a camera attachment that allowed a photographer to expose a portion of the negative and make notations with a stylus. Gaisman sold his patent to Eastman Kodak for $300,000, uh, which was noted in the August 8, 1914 issue of Scientific American on the left here. Just one month later, Kodak ran its first advertisement for the autographic Kodak in the same magazine, uh, but Gaisman's name was entirely absent from the advertising copy. So when inventors like Gaisman sold their patents to established firms, they found their contributions erased in favor of corporate brands, which again, made them less visible. In another example of these alliances, uh, inventor Samuel Rubin developed an improved button cell battery that could withstand the heat and humidity of the Pacific theater during World War II. Rubin licensed the miniature mercury battery to the PR Mallory company, which manufactured millions of batteries for use in portable walkie talkies. After the war, Rubin worked with Mallory's R&D team to commercialize the miniature mercury cell for use in hearing aids, pacemakers, and electric watches. Uh, later, Rubin and Mallory co-developed a new line of copper top alkaline batteries for use in radios, flashlights, and cameras. In 1965, Mallory rebranded its booming battery business and evolved into the multi-billion dollar company we know today as Duracell. And Mallory celebrated this inventor firm alliance by dedicating its new R&D laboratory in Rubin's honor. Now, individual inventors cherished their independence and autonomy, and autonomy, yet they willingly banded together to confront their professional challenges. In the book, I document how independent inventors established a series of organizations to help them commercialize their inventions, lobby for political reforms, and garner respect from a, a skeptical public who assumed they were extinct. Unfortunately, as the group highlighted here demonstrates, inventors' eagerness to join these organizations made them vulnerable to predatory scams. In 1914, the National Institute of Inventors emerged as a cooperative organization in which dues-paying members could receive impartial advice on their new ideas, legal aid for earning and defending patents, and financial assistance for marketing their new inventions. Unfortunately, the National Institute of Inventors was a charade. The founder, Thomas Howard, simply pocketed the membership dues, embezzling thousands of dollars from America's unsuspecting inventors. Now, overall, if you look at this list of organizations on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll, you'll notice that most of these fragile organizations usually disbanded within 10 to 20 years, and this generally uh, left inventors ill-equipped to address their many professional challenges. For example, without the benefit of a durable advocacy group to lobby for their concerns, independent inventors were unable to address inequities in the patent system that favored the corporations. During the Great Depression, Congress convened two hearings to investigate how giant technology firms use their massive patent portfolios and aggressive litigation to exert monopolistic control over their industries 
and crowd out independent inventors. For example, GE brought a series of spurious infringement lawsuits against independent light bulb and radio tube maker Charles Eisler, shown left, in an unsuccessful attempt to drive him out of business. And during these hearings, progressive new dealers introduced a series of reform proposals to level the playing field. However, a combination of factors, including uh, resistance from the lobbying uh, association, the National Association of Manufacturers, um, the inventor's political disorganization, and the onset of World War II um, resulted in, in little new legislation. So overall, independent inventors achieved few of their desired reforms, uh, resulting in a patent system that I would argue even today remains more agreeable to the big corporations. I also describe how independent inventors mobilized to serve their country during World War I and World War II. In an early example of government crowdsourcing, Thomas Edison's Naval Consulting Board evaluated 110,000 ideas submitted by America's grassroots inventors during World War I. As you can imagine, there was some totally harebrained ideas uh, in this group of suggestions. And, and unfortunately, the Navy implemented only one idea by the war's end, a flight trainer uh, invented by Guy Ruggles, shown on the right there. And this poor showing saddled America's independent inventors uh, with a bad reputation and kind of strengthened this drumbeat of, of assertions that they were kind of uh, going the way uh, of the dodo. Now, two decades later, the US Department of Commerce established the National Inventors Council to again mobilize uh, independent inventors, this time for World War II. Again, this, the new council was deluged by hundreds of thousands of military ideas from America's grassroots inventors. But this time, the independents rebounded to implement more than 100 key inventions. For example, besides uh, Samuel Rubin's improved walkie-talkie batteries that we talked about a few minutes ago, Miami beachcomber Charles Hedden adapted his treasure hunting equipment to develop these uh, improved mine detectors that you see here, which saved countless allied lives. So although independent inventors had served admirably during World War II, they could not shake this carefully constructed narrative of their obsolescence. Uh, still, uh, by 1951, Harvard president James B. Conant could observe that, quote, the typical lone inventor of the 18th and 19th century has all but disappeared. Likewise, in 1954, Fortune magazine reported that, quote, the hired inventors who work in corporation laboratories had thoroughly supplanted the lone unaided inventor. Now, conditions, uh, condi uh, conditions shifted considerably over the next half century. So fast forward to the early 21st century. By 2005, Fortune uh, small business celebrated, quote, the return of the lone inventor, while The Economist in 2007 reported that technology firms had left the big corporate R&D laboratory behind. So what the heck happened? How did independent inventors achieve this dramatic turnaround? And what happened to American uh, inventors in R&D labs after World War II? So the epilogue of the book explores how the post-war experiences of independent inventors often resembled, but sometimes diverged in important ways from those of their predecessors. Between 1950 and 1975, the independents remained tempor temporarily overshadowed during R&D's post-war golden age. Fueled by abundant Cold War military spending, the big R&D labs enjoyed big budgets, huge staffs, idyllic corporate campuses, and numerous commercial successes and individual inventors were generally assumed to be crackpots, if not extinct. But then between 1975 and 2000, the corporate R&D labs struggled with a volatile economy, vigorous antitrust enforcement, low research productivity, and some embarrassing commercial failures. In contrast, inventors benefited from federal antitrust and innovation policies that favored entrepreneurial small businesses. So independent inventors like Apple's Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak began to reassert themselves in the economy, especially in the computing and IT sectors. Between 2000 and 2015, I argue that independent inventors experienced a renaissance uh, and the R&D labs, meanwhile, restructured their operations. In a revival of earlier practices, both corporate and federal labs began licensing patents from outside independent inventors to complement the inventions they developed internally and most importantly, the independents rehabilitated their public image, even appearing on TV. So as you can see in the lower left there, now in its 13th season, ABC's Emmy-winning Shark Tank uh, invites Americans each week to tune in while an inventor like Aaron Krauss there in the orange shirt uh, pitches his scrub daddy sponge to a panel of angel investors. 
and independent inventors have even become popular film subjects. So uh, as shown here with a few posters in 2008, the movie Flash of Genius, uh, Greg Kinnear starred as the underdog uh, inventor Robert Kearns, who sued and won uh, against the Detroit automakers uh, who pirated his intermittent windshield wipers. Likewise, in 2015, uh, film Joy, Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence portrayed Joy Mangano, the QVC star who invented the self-ringing Miracle Moth. And just recently, this is just like two or three weeks ago, um, Elon Musk was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year for 2021. So uh, in what I would consider a remarkable historical turnaround, uh, I would say most observers today would consider um, these hobbyists, hackers, and maverick uh, entrepreneurs, not corporate scientists, uh, as the most promising sources of innovation. So let me just conclude by saying, um, independent inventors have en endured many challenges over the years, uh, but they have never disappeared. Um, they have persisted alongside the corporate R&D labs as an important, if less visible, source of inventions. And by recovering the stories of a group once considered extinct, uh, my book shows that the individual genius in the garret, in the garage, and in the dorm room has long been and will always remain an important source of new technologies. So I just wanted to thank everyone for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'll be delighted to take some questions if we have some time, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you. I'd like to start the questions off by asking a little about um, marketing for uh, uh, self-inventors, um, mm -hmm. independent inventors. Um, you know, other than Shark Tank, is there is there an avenue that that inventors tend to to take? You know, that's a great question. Um, there are. Um, uh, what you might call like um, like patent agencies. So you remember that um, uh, that group that was a scam. It was the National Institute of Inventors. Uh, well, these groups still exist today. They're more highly regulated. There's been anti-scam uh, legislation, but essentially it's kind of like a membership group and you can pay a fee uh, to uh, one of these groups. Uh, like there's one called Edison Nation. I think there's one called Inventus, things like that. And um, you know you can make a deal with them where you give them some percentage of uh, you know future downstream revenues, and they will kind of market um, your patent uh, on your behalf in exchange for some cut of the downstream revenues. So um, yeah, those places still exist. And if you're up at two a.m. watching the cable channels, often you'll see like an ad for one of these places. Um, and uh, and you know many of them are reputable. Some of them are disreputable. There's still a lot of uh, scams out there. So I would just urge anyone who's got an invention in their back pocket to to be careful. Eric, that was uh, fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, what about DARPA and and their encouragement of uh, individual uh, inventors? Has that made a dent in in this at all? Absolutely. That's a great question. So, um, you know, I cherry picked different highlights from different decades and stuff like that. But um, at, toward the end of the presentation, I mentioned um, that there were um, a lot of um, kind of uh, pro innovation policies by the federal government uh, that began kind of in the 1980s. So, you know, in the 1970s, you had the OPEC oil embargo and stagflation and the economy was a mess. And so uh, Congress was trying to figure out, well, how can we get ourselves out of this economic mess? And they turned to some economists who found that um, it's small businesses are, tend to be really the heart of job creation and wealth creation. Uh, so the, the federal government created a lot of policies at that time uh, in the early 1980s that tried to sp spread more uh, federal funding to um, small entities, small firms, individuals. So you get like the, the small business uh, investment uh, research grants. You get uh, this kind of uh, crowdsourcing effort where agencies like NASA, DARPA, Department of Defense, they'll actually put a call out and say, hey, we've got this problem to solve. Um, yes, of course, we have all kinds of scientists on staff at DARPA, but we'd love to hear um, what the world thinks, right? The wisdom of crowds. I mean, so this is kind of like reinvigorating this idea that Edison had uh, in the 19 teens during World War I to sort of crowdsource for inventions. So absolutely, um, you know, DARPA and other government agencies are actively, especially since the early 2000s, seeking um, ideas from independent inventors. And this has been part of the, the renaissance is because there's more sort of corporate and federal interest in their ideas, Inventor, individual inventors are doing better now. 
Thank you, Eric, for an interesting presentation. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, who talks about uh, the qualities that tend to make for certain unique uh, results of innovation. And particularly, I'm thinking of the, uh, the work of uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And, and, he, and Gladwell, as you know, um, realized that Jobs and Gates were competing against RCA, uh, Texas Instruments, but they were doing this in their garages. They were 15, 16, 17 years of age. So uh, I'm curious about your re research on uh, inventors. Have you noticed any particular qualities uh, that may stand out that gives some, some insight in terms of the, what goes into being that uh, innovation? That's a, a fantastic question. Uh, so I, I hesitate a little bit to um, uh, say, you know, this is sort of like the core uh, identity characteristic of independent inventors, because what I found is that, and this is what's so great about um, uh, independent inventors is anyone can do it, right? Like you don't, you know, like there's a sort of like anti to get uh, to become a corporate scientist, right? You need a degree and like, you know, all this kind of things. But like, if you have an idea and you're willing to pursue it, anyone can be an independent inventor. So there are, you know, men, women, uh, immigrants, uh, you know, people of every stripe are independent inventors. So I, I hesitate a little bit to say that there's, you know, any sort of uh, core thing uh, that characterizes independent inventors, but there's, but I think there probably are a couple of, of character traits. Um, one of the things that I think is true of all inventors, and this would include corporate inventors too, or federal inventors, government inventors, is that they, when they look at the world, they, they can't help but notice things that they don't like, right? They look at like the ATM machine and are like, oh, it shouldn't work that way. Or, oh, I see this, oh, I wish the mirror in this car worked differently, right? Like they, there's a kind of um, a lens or a way that they see the world where they can't help but notice the flaw. And then it becomes like an obsession and they're like, ah, I can fix this, I can do it better. And I think that's part of what um, drove, uh, you know, Jobs and Wozniak, Gates and, and uh, some of the other garage inventors. They're, as far as those folks too, their timing was great, right? In the mid-1970s, early 1980s, IBM was very content to sell mainframes, right? To big, other big firms and universities and the federal government. And so here were these guys over here in a garage, like assembling kits that were four or 500 bucks uh, with cheap parts. And IBM was like, Psh, that's not even a market. And they kind of, you know, took their eye off the ball. And, you know, eventually Microsoft, uh, Apple became bigger than IBM, right? So uh, they had exquisite timing. <laughs> yes, Eric, great to have you. Very interesting talk. Um, let's suppose I'm an inventor and I have something for farmers in drought stricken California that would allow them to reduce their water use by 25%, still produce the same amount. So how do I protect my invention? The obvious answer is I go to the patent office and I submit a detailed drawing that will tell somebody in China exactly how to produce my device. Uh, so am I really protected in this world of the global economy? What do you do? It's a very perceptive question, right? So the whole, so what a, what a patent does, yes, is it gives an inventor a temporary monopoly on the exclusive use of the invention. But, but the other thing that a patent does is it discloses the invention, yeah, right? So if in you go detail, to the last in one. detail, right? It tells you exactly how to make it. Um, and you know, when the patent system was conceived, uh, like in the 1400s in Venice in Italy, uh, it was the medieval, you're coming out of the medieval times into the Renaissance, and it was the guild system. And so the different trades had trade secrets, right? So like, if you knew how to build, you know, a mill or something, you're a miller, and you kind of knew how to do this thing, you wouldn't share it because that was your, uh, that was your trade secret. Trade and secret. that's, Right. And so what patents, but the problem with trade secrets is it's great for the person with the secret, but then no one else gets the benefit uh, of the common good. So what the patent uh, does is it's a bargain, right? So it tries to balance the individual um, profit incentive with the common good. 
So like in the US patent system, it's, you know, so we'll give you individual inventor, uh, originally 14, now 20 years protection on your idea. But in exchange, after 20 years, it reverts to the uh, common good. It's public domain, right? So anyone can look at that and build the, the water drought uh, reducer. So that's the, the kind of bargain that was struck. So, then, so this is a fundamental question that uh, any inventor has to think about, whether a corporate or individual inventor, is do I keep this thing as a trade secret? So Coca-Cola, great. I mean, no one knows how to make Coke, right? Like they've never patented it. They keep it a secret, great. Uh, or do I want to get a patent? Uh, and there's some considerations, right? A lot of venture capitalists or investors won't invest in you unless you can prove that you've got this temporary uh, monopoly period with the patent. So if you're able to um, attract some investment without a patent, great. A lot of times you need the patent uh, to get the investment. Um, and then a lot of people would say, you know, 20 years, you know, in microchips and computing and smartphones and things like that, the, the, the window, the technological horizon is like three years, five years, right? So like, what's a 20 year patent, right? So they just patent the stuff and they, the pace of innovation almost outpaces the, 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 um, the length of the patent. So I don't know what the answer would be for the, for, for the drought device, but um, it's one of the fundamental questions that an inventor has to think about, do I patent? because of exactly what you suggested is because because now it makes it open to anyone to see how I did it. And especially those who uh, don't mind just being copycats. You got it. So, yep. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you for being with us, Eric. Wonderful job. And you're with a fantastic uh, institution. So you and Monica are working in a good place. My question is, how can we actually pass on this concept, which is kind of what Bill was asking and some others have asked, but how do we pass this, uh, the techniques or the, uh, the pathway towards inventions for youth in schools, whether it's trade or regular high school or uh, even undergraduate school, so that we can really expand small business development. We think of the United States as a small business development engine. The world is way passing us by, even uh, many countries on the African continent are doing as much or more as far as small business development. And one of those uh, centers around inventions and how do we be creative. So what do you think about how we pass this on the skills, the concept, or is it just challenge them to be themselves and hopefully something pops out? Man. Uh, Dr. Hancock, that is such a great question. And if we had an easy answer to that one, man, like that would be great for us uh, as a nation and a world. Um, I mean, I think your question kind of boils down to like, how do we sort of educate and train like the next generation of inventors? How do we sort of cultivate an attitude of inventiveness? How do we, you know, how do we do this? Um, there was some really interesting research that's come out um, two or three years ago by an economist named Raj Chetty. I think he's based at uh, Harvard. And it was uh, really interesting research where he took the patent data, which is all public domain, as we just talked about. So you can easily access you know, the whole history of US patents. And he also was able to access um, tax records and geographic data that was sort of uh, de-identified and things like that. And he was able to cross-reference all this stuff. And he learned a lot about you know, who patentees are in this country. And what he learned is that exposure to another inventor is one of the most important predictors of who will become an inventor. Hmm. And the opposite, so like, so if you grew up in this, um, uh, like, so if you had a parent who was a patentee or you knew someone or, or he could figure out uh, based on the address on your tax return that you lived two doors down from an inventor, he could sort of make this correlation with high st statistical significance that like exposure and um, you know, sort of proximity to another inventor is a, a very high predictor of whether you will become an inventor. Mm -hmm. The opposite is also true. If you never meet an inventor in your life, you have no idea what that's about, and you're unlikely to become an inventor. And so, and then, and so this led to you know, and the the statistics are sort of dismal in terms of like diversity and lo like low income people and things like that. So. In a roundabout way, I guess what I'm saying is if we can, you know, and this is part of the work that the Limelson Center is doing, is if we can, um, you know, bring inventors to the museum, have public programs, allow kids, young adults to meet them, get inspired by them, see that they're just regular people who pull their pants on one leg at a time. They're not some person on a pedestal like Edison. They can be like, oh, wow, you did this. I can do this. 
and I think that that may go a long way to, to, to sort of getting us where you're suggesting we need to go. Yeah, uh, my family, only two people ever worked for themselves. I have a large family, about 100 members. Everybody else were small business owners, ranchers, you know, something, but they had their own business. And my uh, nieces, nephews, cousins uh, all work for themselves. And it's really interesting how that really flows generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And it's just like if you're in the military, that the process of your children going into the military is very, very high. So uh, I can it. hear what you're saying. So thank you for being here and thank you for sharing. Thanks for a great question. Thank you again, Eric. In our way of thanking our speakers, we invented something about 30 years ago called Trees for the Capital. And we plant a tree in the honor of each of our speakers. And in this case, within walking distance of the American History Museum. <laughs> uh, we started by uh, providing a total of 10 replacement cherry blossom trees every year. And then a few years ago, added another 35 trees to help down uh, retree the downtown parks. And if we were meeting in person, I would be handing you a tree certificate but we'll put that in the mail too. But we will be planting a tree uh, and we hope to have our next um, tree planting ceremony in the spring. We do this in partnership with the National Park Service and uh, we've been doing it since 1991. So thank you again. That's our way of uh, showing our appreciation for your being with us today. I'm humble. Thank you so much for the tree. I think that's wonderful in an era where we need more trees to combat climate change. That's terrific. Thank you so much to everyone in the Rotary Club.